want to call your attention this morning to a passage of Scripture found in Galatians chapter 6 and verse, beginning in verse 14. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. Paul, the apostle, would say, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. And the Israel of God there, I think, is talking about the elect family out of all nations, not just the descendants of Abraham. So let's look for a moment at verse 14. Paul, writing to the church at Galatia and warning them about the danger of going back under Moses' law and mixing law and grace and does a, a magnificent job in teaching us that. Now concludes this wonderful letter by saying, but God forbid that I should glory Save in what? Save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is saying the only thing I want to glory in is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The church is not to glory in buildings. As thankful as we are for our building here, we're not to glory in it. We're not to glory in budgets. We're not to glory in baptisms. As thankful as we are for the money we receive here and for the baptisms we have, we're thankful for all of that, but we don't glory in that. The only thing the church is authorized to glory in is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does Paul mean when he says the cross? Well, I certainly don't believe he's talking about the wood of the cross, that piece of timber that Jesus died on 2,000 years ago. We're not glorying in that piece of wood. When I was in the Bible lands, I uh, saw a shop that was selling little pieces of wood from the original cross. And there's no telling how many train loads of that wood they had sold to unsuspecting tourists. <laughs> But if I could have the whole wooden cross intact, I wouldn't want it. Why would, you, why would you glory in a piece of wood? We don't glory in the wood of the cross. What did Paul mean when he said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ? I believe he's talking about the person of the cross who hung on that cross and that's Jesus, and that's who we glory in. And we also glory in the purpose of the cross. What was the purpose of that cross? So that God, through the sacrifice of his son, could save all the objects of his love and have them with him, with him in heaven someday. That's the purpose of the cross. So today we rejoice in the success of the cross, don't we? That on that cross, Jesus actually finished what the Father sent him into the world to do. So if Paul, <clears throat> the great apostle, could not glory in himself, having written 14 books of the New Testament, if he could not glory in his education, having sat at the feet of Gamaliel and could speak eloquently seven or eight languages, if Paul could not glory in his intellect, and his intellect many people acknowledge today, even in the secular world, that Paul had an intellect as great as anybody in the first century just by what he wrote, the book of Romans. <laughs> I tell you, brothers and sisters, this man, by nature, 
was a very gifted man and blessed of God in many ways. But he did not glory in anything he had done. Are y'all getting this? And if Paul couldn't glory in his ministry, in his life, in his accomplishments, I certainly cannot today. All Paul wanted to glory in was the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. I mentioned to the church here some months ago a quote that I came across this year or last year from Socrates, a Greek philosopher who was highly esteemed uh, by the Greeks and still is today in higher education. And Socrates made this statement. He said, it may be that deity can forgive sin, but I cannot imagine how. Now that statement tells us a lot about Socrates. First of all, he's a deep thinker. And he does believe in that there is a deity. And he believes that deity is holy. And he also understands that man is a sinner. So here is his dilemma. It may be that deity can forgive sin, but I cannot imagine how. What Socrates needed to know what you, is what you and I are blessed to know today. Something about the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. How is God going to be able to forgive sinners like us? Even the chief of sinners, the Apostle Paul. Well, the only way he's going to be able to do it is through his son's suffering on the cross on behalf of all of his children. I want to turn with you just a moment to a statement that the Apostle Peter made <clears throat> in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. Listen to this. Who his own self, talking about Jesus. Let's back up to verse uh, 22. Who did no sin. Now that's not talking about Brother Sam and that's not talking about any of you all. We are sinners, right? But it's talking about Jesus who did no sin. From the moment of his birth in Bethlehem until the moment of his death at Calvary, for 33 years, he never committed one sin. Not even one. No foolish thought ever went through his mind. Now that is one of the greatest miracles of all time. That a human being could live on this earth, this fallen, broken earth, and be tempted like nobody's ever been tempted, and never commit one sin. Do y'all believe that today? The Bible says he was holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. Jesus Christ, the night before his crucifixion, went through five trials or actually about six. Three of them were religious trials by the Sanhedrin and the religious leaders who hated him. And they wanted him dead. And three of his trials were secular trials in, in the presence of, of uh, Herod and Pilate. But the conclusion that Pilate came to was, I see nothing amiss in this man. Wow. Now, there were a lot of lies told that night. False witnesses came forward. Yes, sir, there were a lot of lies told and misrepresentations, but they never proved that Jesus was guilty of anything worthy of death. He wasn't guilty of any sin at all. So, <coughs> the Apostle Paul says, who did no sin... Neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. <coughs> when he suffered, he, suffer he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, 
that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Let's look at verse 24 a little more carefully this morning. Peter says, who his own self, talking about Jesus, bear our sins in his own body on the tree. How could that be? How could every sin that every elect child of God would ever commit be placed on the body of Jesus while he was on that cross? Now that is a mystery. I cannot explain it today, but I believe it with all of my heart. The Bible says that God took our sins and laid them on Jesus Christ. And he being innocent and perfect, offered himself to God as a sacrifice for the sins of all the elect family. And when he offered himself to God, what did God do? God accepted the offering he made. God was satisfied with the offering his son made. And let me declare to you this morning that when Jesus Christ died on that cross, he said, it is finished. Meaning <clears throat> that he had saved everyone that he came to save. He didn't make salvation a possibility. He didn't make it available to those that would accept it. He actually saved everyone that the Father had given him to save even before the foundation of this world. How we rejoice in that today. So that's, that's how God could forgive sinners. That's how he did it, through the cross, through his son taking our sins and bearing them and suffering for them and paying for them with his precious blood. But I want to ask you all another question this morning. Why? We, we, we understand how God could forgive sinners. He forgives us because his son paid our sin debt for us in full. But the question I want to ponder with you all this morning and our remaining time is this. Why? Why would God, the Holy Father, give his only son to die for sinners like us on the cross? Why would he do that? The only explanation, beloved, is his unconditional love for his children. I want to turn with you now to Ephesians chapter 3 and begin reading uh, about a prayer that Paul the Apostle offered up for the church at Ephesus. Chapter 3 and verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees under the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now, Paul is going to begin to pray for the church at Ephesus. And we believe in prayer. We ought to pray for the church. We ought to pray for one another. We have a lot of prayer requests here almost every Sunday. People who are sick wanting to be healed. People who are mourning who want to be comforted. People without jobs, and they need jobs. There's a lot of things that we pray for on a daily basis. But I want, you, I want you to notice what Paul is going to pray for on behalf of the church at Ephesus. And I'll tell you right up front, he's not praying that they'll all have new houses and better clothes to wear and new means of transportation. He's not praying that they're going to have more material blessings. What's he going to pray for, for this church? Well, let's notice that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able. Now here's what he's praying for, that the church may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Beloved, the only reason that I can give you this morning why God in glory 
would give his only son to die for sinners like us is because he loved us. And he loved us unconditionally. You know, Jesus Christ is described in the Bible as God's darling. You know what the word darling means? It means the only one of its kind. I was in a restaurant a while back and the waitress kept calling me darling. <laughs> well, I'm not her darling. And she wasn't my darling. I, I don't know if she was wanting a better tip or what, but, uh, you know, she's calling me darling. I've got one darling in this world, and she's in Arkansas today. I don't want any more darlings. She's my darling, and I'm not giving her up for anybody. God the Father had one darling. You know who his darling was? His son. Do you all get that? And his darling was perfect. The father said about his son, this is my beloved son in whom I'm miserably disappointed. No, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And yet he was willing to give up his darling son for sinners like us. To give us a chance of going to heaven? No, nobody's saved by chance. You're saved on purpose according to the covenant of grace that God ordered before the foundation of this world. Now let's look. Paul is praying that the church at Ephesus may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height of the love of God. He mentions the dimensions of God's love. Who can measure God's love today? You know, if, you, if, if somebody gave some of these brethren today a, a, a tape measure, they could measure the dimensions of this building, and in a little while, they could tell us the length and the breadth and the height and the depth of this building. You can measure it. You could even measure Vestavia Hills. But who is going to be able to measure the love of God? Paul says it passes knowledge. Now when he says that you may be able to comprehend with all saints. See that word comprehend is not just knowing about it. But it's actually internalizing it yourself. And my prayer this morning for this congregation is that when you leave here you might be able to some little degree comprehend the love that God has for you, his unconditional love. Notice <clears throat> what he says here. The first dimension he mentions is the breadth of God's love. How broad is the love of God? The Jewish people were mistaken to believe that God's love did not go beyond the Jewish race. They believed salvation was by race and not by grace. And that's why I believe Jesus Christ said to Nicodemus, who was a Jew and a master in Israel, for God so loved the world. That was a new concept to Nicodemus. What? You're telling me God's love goes beyond the Jews? Yes, it didn't mean that God loved every member of Adam's family because we know the Bible says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. But he's letting, he's letting Nicodemus know that God's love is a broad love. How broad is his love? Well, we really don't have to guess at that. The Bible tells us over in the book of Revelation, <clears throat> chapter uh, Five. Let's look at what the Bible says in Galatians chapter 5 about the love of God. <clears throat> well, let's go over to verse uh, chapter 7 and look, um, beginning in verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number. Now, what, what is this great multitude talking about? Is he talking about those going to hell? <laughs> no. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, and then he puts a descriptive clause to that, which no man could number. Do you get that? Are you listening? John says, I saw a great multitude, and he's talking about those that are in heaven. 
And and this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Let's go back to chapter 5 now and verse 9. And John would say, they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to open the book and to... Thou to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. What an incredible revelation that is to us today, that God's love is so broad that it embraces people out of every family, every nation, every language on the face of this earth. You know, Mark Twain said one time, he said that travel is fatal to prejudice, narrow-mindedness, and bigotry. And I believe that. If you get out and travel this world today, and I was blessed when I was 20 years old. I was given an all-expenses trip uh, paid to, uh, to the Bible lands. And I went to seven or eight Bible lands when I was 20 years old. And I had really never left Georgia. <laughs> I mean, maybe once I'd gone down to North Florida. But I want to tell you, everywhere I went, in the Middle East, I met wonderful people. I've been going to Africa. I just had to renew my, my passport <clears throat> because it was a 10-year passport. So I've been going to Africa for 10 years now to to Kenya and Tanzania, and I have met hundreds and hundreds of people from all kinds of religions. And I can tell you by my own experience that travel is fatal to prejudice and narrow-mindedness and bigotry. There are good people all over the world who have been touched, I believe, by the spirit and grace of God. You know, when Jesus was on this earth, I told you that they, they had those trials and, and, and put him to death. But you know what the Bible says? The common people received him, what? Gladly. And I would think the common people were in the majority, wouldn't you? I mean, you and I are just common people today. It was the hierarchy. It was the, it was the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the and the Sanhedrin that hated him, and they were just a few hundred people. But let me tell you, the common people, you know the bad people get all the recognition. Did you know that? Y'all ever see anything on news about uh, good Samaritans? Every once in a blue moon you might. But it's all about the killings and the rapings and the murders and the robberies. And, and, And we got too many of those, I'll admit. But let me tell you, I believe with all of my heart that a vast number of the human race is embraced in the love of God. And that's how broad his love is. As a matter of fact, God may love some people that you don't want him to love. It's a possibility. Many years ago, a woman told me this in Georgia, and it stunned me. It was a staggering statement. It took my breath. She said to me, she said, if my son-in-law goes to heaven, I don't want to go. (laughs) Now, what do you call that? (laughs) Wow. I can understand not liking somebody, but not wanting to go to heaven just because they're there. Listen, God's love is a broad love, folks. And Paul is praying that the church at Ephesus might be able to comprehend with all saints the breadth of his love. But then he says, what about the length of his love? How long is God going to love his people? Well, I believe he loved them before the foundation of the world. You and I didn't have an existence before the foundation of the world, but we were in his mind, (laughs) him knowing all things, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, according as he hath chosen us in Christ, when? When we loved him and accepted him? No, before the foundation of this world. 
Now, if God chose us before the foundation of this world, he knew about us and he loved us. Why do you think God loves us? You think Jesus had to die on that cross and wash us from all our sins so that God could love us? Or did he die on that cross because God did love us? Do y'all get that? Which came first? (laughs) Oh, let me tell you. All the length of his love. I read a while back about some new wedding vows somebody came out with, and this couple used it. And at the wedding, as they were taking their vows, they said that we will stay with you as long as love lasts. Now, what kind of love are they talking about? If they're talking about agape love in 1 Corinthians 13, which is is a sacrificial love and not a feeling love, that might work. But I think they were talking about this romantic um, infatuation love that country music sings about. (laughs) How long does that last? I can tell you for a lot of couples, it ends on the honeymoon. You know, somebody said one time, love is blind, but marriage is an (laughs) eye-opener. But if you've got the right kind of love, it'll last through all the good times and the bad times. That's why the vows say, in sickness and in health, in riches and in poverty, right? But what about God's love? How long is it going to (laughs) last? It lasts for all eternity. He loved us before the foundation of the world. And he's going to love us when this world is on fire. And I want to tell you, you are safe in his love. I wish my voice wasn't so messed up and I could preach to you all this morning like I would like to. But I hope you're getting the message. I hope you're paying attention. All the length of his love. And then Paul mentions the depth of his love. How deep is God's love. How far down in sinful humanity can God's love go? Well, I want to tell you how deep I believe it is. It can embrace the chief of sinners. And you know who that was? That was the Apostle Paul. Paul said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am least, no, of whom I am chief. And I don't believe that was a, I don't think that was just a casual statement on the part of the apostle. He knew himself. He knew what a past he had. He knew how ugly it was. He had Stephen stoned to death. And I can imagine Paul up preaching to congregations like I am this morning. And somebody standing up and saying, I don't want to hear a word you say. You had my grandfather put to death. Another one stands up and says, "You're, you're Saul of Tarsus. I don't want to hear a word you say. You had my grandmother put in jail. He had an ugly past. But God loved him. Are y'all getting this today? That's how deep God's love is. I want to tell you how deep God's love is. When Jesus was hanging on that cross, he was crucified between two thieves. How many of y'all love to be robbed? I was robbed one time in Philadelphia. I'll never forget it. I'd heard Philadelphia was a rough town, even though it is the city of brotherly love. And I parked right across the grave from Benjamin Franklin. Uh, you know, uh, it was a tourist area, and I thought, we'll be safe here. We came back two hours later. Somebody had knocked out the windows in our van, stole our luggage, stole an expensive camera we had bought. I won't ever forget my little daughter, Amanda. She was about five at the time. She couldn't believe anybody would steal from others. And I won't ever forget her stomping her feet. <laughs> she was mad. How many of y'all like to be robbed? (laughs) But here's a man on a cross, two of them, thieves, so bad that the Roman army has condemned them to capital death. But one of them, Jesus loved and embraced. While they were nailed to that cross, both of them railed on Jesus, mocked him and made fun of him and said, you saved others, why don't you just save us? 
But a miracle took place in the heart of one of those thieves. I believe he was born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus turned to him and said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Wow! His whole life was a life of stealing. I want to tell you, God's love embraced a thief and took him with him to glory. You know, Jesus came to save sinners, and he took a big one with him right back to glory. The all, can you all rejoice in that today? That salvation is not by chance. It's not part what Jesus did and part what we do. It's what Jesus did that gets us into glory. Then what about the, the height of his love? How long is God... How high is God going to love us? Well, to the third heaven, beloved. And so Paul is praying that the church, and if you could leave here today with some comprehension of how much God loves you, I want to tell you, I believe it would transform your life. Live as though you're loved by God the Father. And, and let me tell you, if God loves somebody, you know it makes them invaluable I want to turn with you to Mark 9 just a moment and notice a statement that Jesus makes in uh, verse 41 of Mark 9. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because ye belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward and whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and were cast into the sea. Notice what Jesus is saying there. He's saying, one of these my little ones. Who would that be? I would think it'd be Brother Sam. I would... I would fit in that category. One of these, my little ones. He's not talking about his apostles. He's not talking about the great preachers of the ages. He's not talking about people who have great recognition in the world. He's talking about these little ones. And let me tell you, he said, you'd be better off with a millstone around your neck and thrown into the sea than defend one of my little ones. What makes this little one so valuable? The fact that God loved them and they're precious. Precious in his sight. Wednesday night I was teaching from Hebrews chapter 9 and I said to the people there, I said, just picture in your mind a moment, a little baby, an African, uh, an African baby, native African, dying, maybe just a year old or whatever, and their stomach is swollen from malnutrition and their body is covered with flies and filth. And if people see that little child, they would think that's worthless. That's a nobody. But I want to tell you, I want you to get this. If God loves that little baby and Jesus died for it, in the morning of the resurrection, that little baby is going to have a glorified body, just like the body of Jesus. And it's going to be just as valuable and just as precious to God in glory as you and I are. Are you getting this? God's love makes all the difference. If God loves that little one, he gave his son to die for it, and it'll be in glory. You say, well, Brother Sam, if God loved it so much, why didn't he do more for it on this earth? I can't answer that question. I know one thing, he's done a lot for me, and I didn't deserve it. I, I, but it's his love. See, he's going to make it all just right in eternity, right? There's a lot. We live in a broken, messed up, troubled world, folks. I hear the most awful things. Almost every week I get a phone call from somebody from North Carolina or California or here in Alabama or in Georgia about some tragedy. And I carry a lot of heartaches today. I carry a lot of secrets I wouldn't share with anybody. We do live in a broken, messed up world. But I want to tell you, because he lives today in heaven and he's coming back to this earth with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and all that are alive and remain will be caught up and those in the graves will be caught up. And, and then what? 
Then what's going to happen? He's taking us to a perfect world where there are no tears, no sorrows. Isn't that what the book of Revelation says about it? No death in that city, not made with hands. Eternal in the heavens. There will be no funeral processions down those streets of gold. There will be no funeral wreaths hung on the doors of those mansions. It will be glory forever as we bask in the love of a God that loved us unconditionally. Now does that mean God lacks everything about us? No. I like to tell this story. Elder J.W. Hartley, one of my dear friends who is now in glory, he went off on a preaching trip like I did this weekend, and his family couldn't go, and he, it had rained while he was gone, and his little son Jackie was out in the yard on Sunday afternoon playing in a mud puddle. And little Jackie <clears throat> saw his daddy that he loved, and he got up and was going to run to his daddy. Brother J.W. said he had mud all over him. <laughs> He tried to brush himself off, you know, and get presentable, but you can imagine how successful little Jackie was. Mud everywhere. And Brother Hartley said, I had on my coat, my tie, my shirt. I didn't want all that mud on me, but there comes little Jackie with those arms stretched out. And he said, I didn't love all that mud, but I sure did love what was behind the mud. And he reached down and embraced that little boy and forgot about the mud. I want to tell you all this morning. God doesn't love our sins. And, and after that was over, Jack, uh, Brother Hartley told him to go and wash up. God doesn't want you and me sinning. He doesn't want us. He doesn't love our sins, but he loves us. I heard a father say a while back to his son, he said, Son, I love you with all my heart, but I'm having a hard time liking you. Now, what does that father mean by that? There's a lot of wisdom in that. He, he, he means, I don't like the way you're living, but I love you and I'll do anything I can for you. I won't, I won't, let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, help us in this moment to be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height of your love and help us in turn to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and might and help us to love one another even as we love ourselves. We pray this, we trust fervently in Jesus' name, amen. Do we have a selection? <clears throat> yes, what number is that? 486. Brother Joshua, would you please come and read that? Uh, 486. While we stand, the opportunity is given for membership in the church today. <clears throat>